Hi everyone. Thanks for tuning in to Climate Voters Tonight. I'm Hannah Blatt, filling in for Peter. Throughout the episode, you'll hear from me and my colleague Cecile Brown as we cover the news from the past two weeks. First, we'll turn it over to Peter. He was in Wisconsin for election night and we'll go over the results. Then we'll turn our attention back to Washington DC where we'll give you an update on the dirty energy package and the latest on PFAS and how the EPA is stepping up. Last, I sat down with our own Andrew Lentz to talk about everything from Senator Booker's compost and zero waste food bills to climate smart agriculture policy. Peter, over to you. Behind me is the Lisbon Avenue staging location for the Wisconsin Democratic Party. This is where hundreds of volunteers and staffers have been working long hours to get out the vote by knocking on doors in and around Milwaukee in support of Janet Protasiewicz. I've been here for the last week and a half helping out and doing my part. A uh, quick recap on the candidates. Janet Protasiewicz believes uh, partisan gerrymandering is an unconstitutional practice and a threat to fair elections. Her opponent has mostly aligned himself with the current majority on the state Supreme Court. With us now is Dory Davenport, a local volunteer with the Wisconsin Democrats. She's been helping coordinate volunteers uh, in this staging location, uh, making sure that they have the resources that they need to get out and uh, knock doors to mobilize voters. Thanks so much for sitting down with us, Dory. Sure. So what got you motivated to do this work? Since I retired, I have seen the state of politics in Wisconsin go get increasingly contentious and, and divided and extreme. Everything we can do to get out the voters here is really important. With this election in particular, getting Janet Protasiewicz elected to the Supreme Court is going to affect the future, our future, our children's future, all of our futures in such a huge way. It just it, I feel like democracy has a huge target on its back right now, and this election in particular is really important for Wisconsinites. Okay. Well, as you know, I work for EDF Action, so I wanted to ask you, how have you seen uh, climate change affect southeastern Wisconsin? We've gotten a lot of uh, extreme rainfalls. We've had many more flooding events with rainfalls that are so heavy that we're getting water drop alerts. I get these water drop alerts on my phone saying wow. because of the heavy rain the sewer is overflowing and it's going to dump into Lake Michigan so please restrict your water use wow. yeah. until further notice. I've had, I don't know, two of those this year already and it, what, April? We, I probably had a half a dozen of them last year and nor before that I would get one a year. So that's one little way. Um, the seasons have just seemed really wonky, like this winter. It was very, very mild for the first four months or three months, and then all of a sudden we got all our snow in February and March, and it was, it was well, it was really annoying. But right, beyond of course. that, we, we've just noticed a lot of little things like that that seem to be happening every year as opposed to a one-off year where it just, you know, is right. a fluke. You know, these extreme weather events that we're seeing are becoming so much more common and they are really affecting the people who are least able to adapt, um, including with, uh, communities here in Milwaukee mm -hmm. um, that are already disadvantaged, that are, that are less able to withstand uh, you know, increased flooding and, and other extreme weather events. Very true. Um, so, I mean, what's, if you can just tell us a little bit, you've already talked about it to a certain extent, but what is at stake in today's Supreme Court election. Wisconsin has been consistently in the top three gerry most gerrymandered states in the country. Without the fair maps coming up again before the Supreme Court, if Janet Protasiewicz isn't elected, these maps are going to stand. Absolutely, and that's one of the big reasons that I'm here and that I've been here for the past week and a half is to make sure that these uh, unfair maps are redrawn because right now we ha unfortunately have uh, pretty strong majority in the Wisconsin legislature that is really hostile to climate action and that isn't really interested in taking it seriously. They so, think it's not real. Right. I mean, <laughs> exactly. Well, Dory, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us. It was really great talking to you and thank you for the work that you've been doing. Thank you for being here with us. Absolutely. You know I'm thrilled to be in the Midwest. All right. Well, I've got some great news. Our candidate, Janet Protasiewicz, won last week. This means that if and when the gerrymandering case gets back on the state Supreme Court docket, democracy has a fighting chance. 
And yes, we do anticipate it winding its way through the court system in the months ahead. But don't take it from me. Listen to Janet's victory speech. Well, Wisconsin, guess what? We did it. We did it. Just over a year ago, I got into this race. I made the decision because I saw that Wisconsinites were ready for common sense and fairness on their Supreme Court. Today's results mean two very important and special things. First, it means that Wisconsin voters have made their voices heard. They've chosen to reject partisan extremism in this state. And second, it means our democracy will always prevail. We're thrilled about her victory for Wisconsin, our country, and our climate. As promised, we're here on Climate Voters Tonight to give you an update on the House Republican leadership's efforts to turn back the clock on climate progress with their dirty energy package. The bad news, it passed. The good news, thousands of EDF action members like you contacted their representatives to oppose this bill. And between the Senate and the President, we have a solid firewall, making this bill dead on arrival. As noted in the last episode, this bill was a big polluter giveaway, trying to repeal several clean energy initiatives and transformative programs that reduce pollution, as well as dilute the Bipartisan Toxic Substance Control Act, which protects American families from the health impacts of harmful chemicals. So the silver lining is that our clean energy transition, our ability to protect communities, and our ability to reduce emissions will continue to take place thanks to the great work President Biden and the last Congress has already done. It really was thanks to all your help that we we're equipped in this position to defend our progress every step of the way. All right, so we're moving on to PFAS, which are commonly referred to as forever chemicals. And that's because they can remain in our environment indefinitely. And some of them can even remain in our bodies for years. And it's no surprise, they're dangerous to our health. Unfortunately, PFAS are everywhere. They're in nonstick cookware, grease resistant food packaging, and even waterproof clothing. And they don't just stay there. They seep into our food and our water. This can lead to a wide range of serious health effects as these chemicals accumulate in our body with increased risk of cancers and high blood pressure, decreased vaccine response in children, and even declines in infant birth rates. But our government can lead and they're doing something about it. The Environmental Protection Agency recently announced the first ever national standard to protect our communities from these forever chemicals in our drinking water. With this strong and forcible national drinking water standard, we can aggressively tackle the harmful chemicals in our waterways. This rule is still in draft form. So please join us in calling for the EPA to adopt the strongest possible PFAS protections today at edfaction.org slash act now. I'm joined tonight by Andrew Lenz, our Director of Federal Affairs of Agriculture Policy to take a deep dive in, you guessed it, agriculture policy. Thanks for joining me and our members on Climate Voters tonight, Andrew. We're going to jump right in with the first question which was submitted by one of our members. What is the Compost Act and the Zero Food Waste Act? Yeah, these are two bills um, that have been introduced in Congress by Senator Cory Booker. Um, by their titles, you can maybe guess a little bit about what they're about. Um, the Compost Act would actually um, qualify composting as a, as a conservation practice under uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Services definition um, and allow it to, to qualify for uh, conservation programs that USDA uh, operates. Um, obviously composting is, is hugely important to the environment. It also helps um, with the, the next topic in food waste, but um, it is a, a more environmentally friendly way to dispose of food and it also acts as a um, soil amendment, um, a, a natural organic soil amendment that can help improve our soil health um, and help us grow uh, the next generation of food. So it's really important. Um, the, the next one, the Food Waste Act, uh, is, is also important and also introduced by Senator Booker. 
Um, that would uh, create a grant program at the Environmental, Environmental Protection Agency to help organizations and individuals um, incentivize them to adopt uh, food waste uh, practices and help to reduce food waste and, and spread education about how to do that. Um, there are, by some estimates, food waste accounts for about 35% of the emissions in the, in the food chain. And so uh, it's a huge problem. So it's really important that we can address both these issues. Um, so I'm encouraged to see some action in Congress to do that. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for that. For me, composting and reducing waste is an individual action I take in my daily life, and I would encourage others to do so as well. But as we know, individual actions won't solve the climate crisis alone, and we really need to reduce emissions at a large scale and uh, make industries like farming more sustainable and incorporate climate resilience. Um, but a follow-up question I have is if our members wanted to show their support for these, for these bills, what can they do? Yeah, great question. So uh, I mentioned that these, these two bills were, were introduced by Senator Booker. I don't believe at this time they have um, any Republican co-sponsors. And you know the farm bill process is a bipartisan process. And so um, you know this will have to pass through both houses of Congress, of course, in a divided Congress. And so uh, we'd really like to see a little bit more bipartisan support for, for some of these types of measures. And so if you live in areas represented by uh, our Republican colleagues, and I would encourage you to give them a call and try to see if we can't maybe um, reach across the aisle here and try to get some additional support. Awesome. I know our advocates work really hard on our priority bills, and I know they're appreciative that you are answering their questions, but I want to flip it to all of the legislation swirling on the Hill. Um, obviously, you've mentioned the Farm Bill, and our social channels have been talking about it a lot with the budget hearings. Um, can you talk briefly about the importance of the bill and what is the timeline for our activists to get involved? Sure. Yeah, Farm Bill is a um, is a massive omnibus piece of legislation that sets all federal agriculture, food and agriculture policy. It, it sets programs uh, on a five-year authorization, and so every five years we go through the process of writing a new Farm Bill. This current, the current Farm Bill that we're operating under expires at the end of this fiscal year, at the end of September, and so we are really pushing to have everything written and done before that deadline, and so that's really our goal. Um, you know. A lot of the, the advocacy around Farm Bill will be happening, you know, it has already begun to some degree and then will continue to ramp up through the summer. And so um, that's when we were, we we're really hoping that we can, you know, mobilize our, our members um, and, you know, viewers like you to get out there and really um, talk about the importance of food policy. Um, and that's, that's really what we're addressing here. And so, um, you know, whether you live in a city um, and nowhere near a farm or whether you're a farmer yourself, uh, you know, this touches all of our lives. And so we really need everybody to really pay attention and, and to get involved and try to pass this thing on time. Awesome. Well, I know there are some, all, some smaller agriculture bills that our members may not be familiar with. Can you walk them through them? Sure, yeah. So I, I sort of touched on it. The Farm Bill is, is really a, a package of, of many smaller bills. Uh, that we refer to as marker bills. And so there's a couple that we've already endorsed. The first of which is uh, we've worked really closely with um, Senator uh, Deb Fisher's office in developing the Precision Agriculture Loan Act, which basically would, uh, would establish a new loan program through USDA to help smaller and medium-sized farmers who maybe don't have the sort of upfront capital expenditures to, to secure the new innovative precision agriculture technology. This technology is really, um, first of all, just really cool in that it's really cutting edge, but also it will help farmers reduce their inputs and, and their input costs, but also the amount of, um, it'll help them reduce emissions by you know, taking less turns with the tractor. Uh, they can do that, those things in a more efficient way. It'll help them be more targeted in their fertilizer application. Just streamlining, making these operations more efficient will ultimately reduce their, their carbon footprints. Another one introduced by uh, Senators Klobuchar and Thune is called the Agriculture Innovation Act. Um, that would direct USDA to streamline a lot of the data collection. You know, USDA has myriad programs, including conservation programs and others, um, for which they collect da data um, from farmers as they participate in these programs to sort of do some verification of what's happening in those programs. And so 
Um, but there's, there's never really been a great way to collect and analyze that data. This bill would help USDA uh, in that process to allow for more innovators to um, access that data and to develop new tools and, um, and measure measurement capabilities that help us benchmark and measure progress on climate change. That makes a lot of sense. And I know we've covered a lot today, but agriculture legislation is something that we're gonna keep coming back to uh, all of this year. So stay tuned for updates of how you, our members, can get involved in advocating for strong climate smart, for a strong climate smart farm bill. Happy Earth Month, everyone. We'll be running a social media campaign around investing in our future. Follow along on our social channels, that's TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and now YouTube to stay connected. As you heard on the last segment of Climate Voters Tonight, Governor Youngkin is trying to roll back Virginia's participation in the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, also known as REGI. The public comment period where Virginians could weigh in on this decision just officially closed. The response was clear. The vast majority of Virginians who submitted comments oppose Governor Youngkin's rollback and support staying in Reggie. So thank you to all who took action. We hope the governor listens. These past two weeks have been busy for the Biden administration and electric vehicles. First, the EPA granted California a waiver to adopt stronger pollution protections for new cars and trucks while the Treasury Department rolled out a proposed rule around guidelines for the electric vehicle tax credits that consumers will be able to qualify for.